Hey, it's Nathan. And last time I was at the chalkboard, I went ahead and talked about Vitaly sets and the Vitaly set construction. I wanted to go ahead and continue talking about that idea of sets that don't have an idea of measure on them by talking about these things. In particular, I want to go over how we can create a function that is continuous where, you know, our intuition is that like it's like stretching a rubber band. Um, and we can go ahead and create a function that's really crazy and how it stretches things. And it will actually um, break measurability. In order to do that, there are some prerequisites that I need to go ahead and just refresh really quick. And I will point out some videos in the cards up here where I've talked about these things in some manner before, if you're interested in more of my commentary on them. So the first prerequisite is that we know what the canter set construction on the close interval from zero to one is, and that the canter set has measure zero, as well as its complement, that being the open intervals that are removed during the canter set construction have measure one. The next thing we should keep in mind as we talk about stuff in this video is that a point is in the canter set if it has a unique ternary expansion consisting of only zeros and twos. This one I haven't talked about specifically, but the main idea comes up in this video where I took a fractal geometry perspective on the whole 0.9 repeating equals one problem. So if you want to get a gist of why that might be, that would be a good place to start. And you'd have to think about what the canter set construction is doing with that idea and then you'll be fine. And then the third and final thing to keep in mind is what we talked about last time I did a video at the chalkboard, which is Vitaly's theorem. That is, if a set has positive measure, assuming the axiom of choice, then it must have a subset where measure is not an adequate descriptor of that subset. Now that we have those prereqs in mind, we can go ahead and start talking about the cantor lebesgue function, which is a pretty messy function. This is what it looks like. So let's go ahead and do a few examples of what this function does to certain values of x. First, let's go ahead and look at an example where our point is in the cantor set. For example, let's take x is equal to 1 fourth. Now, it might not be immediately clear why 1 fourth is in the cantor set, but we can go ahead and write 1 fourth as 2 ninths over 8 ninths, which is just the formula for this infinite sum of a geometric series with first term 2 ninths and common ratio 1 ninth. So one fourth has a unique ternary expansion only consisting of zeros and twos and is therefore in the canter set. Thus, by definition of the canter lebesgue function, we have that phi of one fourth is equal to this sum, which turns out to be one third. For another example, let's look at something that's not in the canter set. If we go ahead and take x is equal to one half, then x is not in the canter set since the point one half is removed along with the open interval that is taken out in the first step of the canter set construction. So when we go ahead and apply phi to one half, we have to take the supremum of phi of y over all y in the canter set that are less than or equal to one half. That supremum will be phi of one third, since the canter lebesgue function is an increasing function. Now, the canter lebesgue function being an increasing function is something that you should verify for yourself for sure. If you look at its raw math form, it is pretty straightforward. It can be a little bit overwhelming since you've got like a sum and a supremum and you're working in the context of the canter set. But if you just push through a proof, it is pretty okay to get through. Anyway, continuing on. And since one third's ternary expansion that contains only zeros and twos is just 0, 0.0 followed by a list of twos, with a bit of manipulation, we have this sum, which ends up giving us phi of one third is equal to one half, and therefore phi of one half is equal to one half. So although it is a little bit clunky defining the canter lebesgue function in this way, as long as you know the ternary of what you're throwing into it, you can get to the sum. And once you know the sum, you can start comparing values. And so we can actually start talking about 
its continuity. It's a little bit involved, but we can go ahead and figure out that this thing is continuous, which we'll do here in a second. But first, let's go ahead and start with what the graph of this thing looks like. So the first thing to do when you go to graph the Cantor the Big Function is to actually think about it in a less specific way. In particular, when we go ahead and pick a point that was removed by the kth step of the Cantor set construction, it belongs to one of the two to the k minus one intervals that was removed by that step in the Cantor construction process. If we order the total number of intervals removed by that step from left to right as we read from zero to one on the number line, then the value of the Cantor Lebesgue function at any point in the mth interval in that list will just be m divided by 2 to the k. This is a great thing to verify because it gives you a really good intuitive understanding behind how this symbolic mess of a definition of the Cantor Lebesgue function turns into this method of graphing the Cantor Lebesgue function by focusing on those open intervals. So, this idea that in the kth step, and the mth interval that was removed by that step, the value of the Cantor Lebesgue function will just be m over 2 to the k is core to the following argument that the Cantor Lebesgue function is a continuous function. So, first, let's go ahead and talk about continuity at points that are not in the Cantor set. Then, for any epsilon greater than zero, there is some delta neighborhood around our point that we're interested in such that every point in that neighborhood is mapped to a constant. That is, every point in this open interval of radius delta around our point of interest is in one of those plateaus in the graph. So we end up satisfying the epsilon delta condition for continuity in this case. The case where you're a point in the Cantor set is a little bit more involved. So for each step in the Cantor set construction, there exists a first open set to the left of x and a first open set to the right of x that were removed at some point in the construction process, such that points in the left interval are all less than x and points in the right interval are greater than x. But then when we go ahead and apply the Cantor Lebesgue function to our two points of interest, we go ahead and get something that is less than 1 over 2 to the k, because the difference between the Cantor Lebesgue function on that left interval and the right interval is just 1 over 2 to the k. But we can go ahead and do this for any step in the Cantor set construction. So for our given epsilon, we just need to figure out which k is large enough so that we can satisfy the continuity condition. And so this implies that we have continuity at points in the Cantor set. So now that we have a handle on some of the properties of this ugly function that uh, is probably the most complicated part of this whole argument uh, stands the prereq stuff that I'm assuming uh, we can go ahead and start talking about this other function, which we'll, we'll I'll, you know, board. We're going to go to the board. Let's go to the board. So the nice thing about continuous and increasing functions is that if you go ahead and add two of them together, you get a continuous increasing function. So we're going to go ahead and look at the function phi of x plus x, where phi is the Cantor Lebesgue function, and we're going to call it c, or, or psi for those of you who are unaware of the modern Greek alphabet, but I'm going to say c. Since the Cantor Lebesgue function and the identity function are both continuous, that means the sum in c is also a continuous function. Similarly, since the Cantor Lebesgue function is weakly increasing because it does have those plateaus and the identity function is strictly increasing, then we know that our c function is strictly increasing as well. And it goes from the closed interval from 0 to 1 to the closed interval from 0 to 2. So we can go ahead and ask the question, how does c and the open sets that are removed during the construction of c um, sounds like I'm saying C, but I'm saying C, and I, that's going to get confusing. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Really committed to, to C. Anyway, so one of the questions we can go ahead and ask is, how does the Cantor set and its complement change in measure after mapping with C? So first, notice that for any open interval that's removed from the Cantor set construction, a point x in that interval 
is sent to itself plus a constant related to the plateau of that interval in question in the graph of the canner lebesgue function. So the measure of the interval before and after applying this C function is the same since the interval is just a translation of itself by a constant term. This argument applies for every single interval removed during the canner set construction process. So we can go ahead and say the following, which gives us that the measure of the image of the complement of the canner set is one. However, this means that the image of the canner set must also have measure one, since the image of the canner set's complement and the image of the canner set are disjoint and union together to form the entire interval from zero to two. Now we can finally go ahead and apply what we talked about in the last video where I was at the chalkboard. In particular, by Vitaly's argument, we can go ahead and find a subset A of the image of the canner set that does not have a measure associated with it. However, the pre-image of this set has a measure. Since it is a subset of measure zero, it must also have measure zero. And so even though our function has two very nice properties, it is continuous and it is strictly increasing, it still sends a set with measure to a set where measure is not an adequate descriptor of that set. So yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of weird. It's kind of like, eh, you know, it's another reason why Vitaly sets just make the world a weirder place if you decide to observe the axiom of choice when you're going about proving stuff. Uh, but essentially, that's all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I'm, I'm, I plan on talking about things other than size. I've been on like a size and measure shtick uh, for the, like the last four or five um, chalk videos, it feels like. That might be an over-exaggeration on my end. It might just be a really long time in between videos and I'm getting things confused, but you know, I'm gonna talk about something a little bit different next time. So there is a plan there. Um, but yeah, anyway, as always, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more math stuff that I do here on the channel. As always, I'm Nathan, this was Chalk, and I will see you next time.